This was the surface carburettor and the principles of which was the first carburettor to ever be used. And you are now going to find out the unique way in which it worked and some interesting history behind it. Welcome to the Repair Specialist channel. Knowledge is power. So let's get to it. Unlike the carburettors we see today, which rely mainly on a main jet and a venturi, which creates the level of airflow that can draw out the fuel and atomize it, making it ready for combustion. The surface carburettor relied on the evaporation of the fuel so it could harness the fumes. And the function of this carburettor we'll delve into very shortly. But first, let's have a quick look into the carburettor's history. Now, there are quite a few claims as to the origin of the surface carburettor and who actually invented it. And whilst there are many claims, this surface carburettor principle can be dated as far back as 1826, where the American inventor Samuel Moray invented and showcased his version of the internal combustion engine. Now, this internal combustion engine didn't quite work like the ones we see today. It was more like a steam engine. But unlike the engines today that run on gasoline fuel, this engine's primary source of fuel was turpentine. But on that engine was apparently a type of surface carburettor. Unfortunately for Moray, however, he couldn't find the financial backings at the time to bring his inventions to production. And so over the years that followed, many inventors and engineers started to produce the carburettor and patent it. To name of a few cases, but not all, 1875 saw the inventor Siegfried Marcus from Vienna produce the first petrol car with a carburettor. A year later, in 1876, another claim for the carburettor's invention come from Luigi de Christophorus of Italy. Then in 1884, a British man named Edward Butler apparently created the first spray carburettor for his engine. A year later in 1885 came another claim for the carburettor's invention by Carl Benz and in 1886 he patented his idea. And as the years went by the carburettor was further developed by the likes of George Kingston making the Kingston carburettors and William Carter creating the Carter Carburettor Company. All of this, of course, has further developed into the modern carburettors we see today. And whilst the invention and development of the carburettor is much more diverse than what I've mentioned, with far more people and ideas involved, this briefly skips over just some of the detail of its history. So back to the surface carburettor, the very first carburettor principle. Whoever was really, truly the first to invent the surface carburettor may be somewhat controversial, but its design of simplicity was fascinating. First of all, the surface carburettor principle was the carburettor and the fuel tank all in one. So the fuel sat at the bottom of the carburettor here and was most probably refilled by a small hole somewhere at the top. And just on the fuel's surface was this surface plate. This was not a float like what we see in carburettors today, but this plate did stay on the surface of the fuel. And in some variations of the surface carburettor, this plate was self-adjustable with the level of the fuel. So it always remained on top. This pipe, known as the chimney, was the air inlet into the carburettor and part of the plate structure. This pipe beneath it was the inlet pipe to the engine. And so when the engine started to run, it drew in a suction pressure through this pipe. This suction pressure was felt throughout the pipe and in the air throttle control unit, most likely via a small hole connecting the main body of the carburetor to this air throttle controlling unit. This being enclosed and airtight from its environment, this suction pressure was most likely felt through a second hole. This hole led to the carburettor's internal space. And so as the suction pressure from the engine continued, that pressure was felt throughout the whole internal space of the carburettor. 
and within that internal space was the fuel's vapours. And so these vapours were naturally drawn in through the suction pressure and to the engine. But as the suction pressure built up within the carburettor, it drew in air from the outside via the chimney. And so as air was pulled in through the inlet and down the chimney, it was then drawn out the bottom of the chimney past this very small one-way valve float and displaced underneath the plate as bubbles through the fuel and out into the space of the carburettor, creating that flow of air. Now that the engine has got that continuous supply of air, it can now continually draw in the fuel vapours. The displacement of the air underneath this plate through the fuel helped to instigate the evaporation of the fuel and a further aid in evaporation was this pipe. This pipe was an offshoot from the main exhaust and carried with it hot exhaust gases. As these gases passed through this pipe, it naturally warmed up the fuel and further instigated the evaporation of the fuel and so a plentiful supply of combustible fuel vapour. So then this combustible fuel vapour which was hopefully now in rich supply didn't have to reach the engine in this concentration. It was in fact adjustable by the throttle air control unit here. Because as we saw earlier the combustible air vapour mix has to first pass through the throttle air control area before reaching the engine intake pipe and as it passes through the throttle worked by rotating this barrel inside the unit to the point where the hole on the barrel is in line with the hole that enters the internal space of the carburettor and this barrel can be moved in such a way that can open up the hole at the bottom fully or partially close it or fully close it. This allowed a manually adjustable level of vapour air mix to reach the engine. Adjusting it like this made it possible for the operator to change the engine RPM. And of course it was this that acted as the throttle. The second barrel on this side also had a small hole that can be open and closed to the environment. This barrel could be rotated to allow more or less fresh air into the system to mix with the air vapour mix, either to leave it in a rich vapour state or to dilute and lean it out. This barrel acted as an air to fuel adjustment, a primitive form of the fuel adjustment screws we see on modern carburettors today. As simple and primitive as this carburettor is, we can't help but stand back in awe of its design and the way it works.